Fortunately, our handsomest politicians came up with a cheap, last-minute way to combat global warming. But what if we could tap into all those materials flying around in space? Some scientists claim we could mine asteroids in the future. Yes, asteroids. Ever since 2063, we simply drop a giant ice cube into the ocean every now and then. Of course, since the greenhouse gases are still building up, it takes more and more ice each time. Now, if this sounds out of reach, remember that just six years ago, the Rosetta spacecraft managed to land on a 2.5 mile wide comet. Comet ice, the new solution to global warming. Wait, where do we get the ice? Oh, Halley's Comet, of course. The only sufficient source of ice cubes that don't have bugs in them. Thus solving the problem once and for all. But once and for all! But why not? After all, if you put an ice cube in a glass, does it not get cooler? And mm, comets are mostly ice. So could you not sensibly cool the planet with cometary ice? And how long would Ooh, Halley's, Halley's comet, comet, if we could just dump the whole thing into the ocean, actually keep us cool for? No spoilers quite yet. Now, the interesting thing about comets is they are blocks of ice at about 100,000 degrees Celsius. That's hotter than the surface of the sun. I don't really mean that in a cryptic fashion, but a... A literal one. But how can that be? Ice melts at zero degrees Celsius. So how can it be a block of solid ice hotter than the surface of the sun? Cool. So let's take a look at the universe, shall we? Something that you've probably breathed out in the last millisecond or so. Some air and a small droplet of water. This is actually a pretty good proxy for most of the matter on the Earth. A bunch of sticky balls called atoms and temperature is how fast they go. So what you're looking at here is a computer simulation called molecular mechanics and it's actually pretty accurate for these sorts of things. The blue diatomic molecules there are nitrogen, that's most of the air that you're breathing. The red ones are oxygen, those are the ones you die in about a minute if you don't get enough of, and the jiggly ball is water. The stuff that makes up about 70% of your body and covers about 70% of the planet's surface. Now, in any system like this that's a thermal equilibrium, on average, all of the particles have the same energy. Now, some of these particles travel faster and some of them slower. But on average, the energy of every particle in the system will look exactly the same. And the faster the average speed, the hotter the system. That is, energy, the speed, is essentially temperature. Now, water molecules are stickier than gas molecules, so they mostly stick together in a ball we call water. And the gas molecules are also sticky, but much less so. Now, water molecules evaporating is actually a super rare event, which is why if you leave a glass of water out, it'll take a long time to evaporate. Even at 100 degrees Celsius with a powerful heater, it'll take 10 plus minutes to evaporate all of the water molecules from a, a liter of water. Now, here's your fundamental problem. You want to cool Earth down. That is, you need to make the molecules here move very slightly slower. How much by? Well, if you didn't notice me doing it, that's how much you buy. But wait, you said temperature was just the average speed of the molecules. So what happens if I take that ball of water and accelerate it? Doesn't that mean that it's actually hotter? Well, kind of depends on your frame of reference. So this is a drop of water that's just sat here on Earth, sort of at thermal equilibrium. And this is a drop of water shooting through space at about 100 times the speed of a rifle bullet. Now, both look like liquid water. However, remember what I was saying, the temperature is essentially the average speed of the molecules. Now, let's take a step back to a little bit of orbital mechanics. The sun is a big, heavy thing that creates a big potential well, and as you get closer to it, you go faster. And it turns out that when you're at about the distance of the Earth going around the sun, and yes, that's us, the little red one there whizzing around. I've obviously sped up time a little here. It takes usually about a year for the Earth to go around the sun, rather than a few seconds. But that does mean that our orbital velocity around the sun is some 30 kilometers per second. But it turns out if you're on the edge of the solar system just falling into the sun, that's also about the speed that you get by the time you're at the distance from where the Earth is from the sun. 
This is basically what comets do with their highly elliptical orbits. That is, comets, when they whiz past the Earth, are typically travelling also about 30 kilometres per second. This is, incidentally, the next flyby of Halley's Comet, which is in the summer of 2061. And the program I'm using to visualise this is called Celestia, which is, first of all, free and strongly recommended. I should stress that at this point that the speed of sound is about 0.3 kilometres per second. That's about the speed bullets go at. So we're looking at about a hundred times the speed of a rifle bullet. That's how quickly you're going around the sun. And there is an awful lot of going quickly and not a lot of spinning going on. So this is what it actually looks like as the Earth is going around the sun. Uh, yeah, it does rotate a bit, but most of it is just the Earth hurtling through space. And the guy following just after, that's the moon. So if you ever want to do the Superman thing, you know, faster than a speeding bullet, uh, the quick version is just look up at sunrise, and that's the direction you're hurtling through space at about 30 kilometers per second. These are numbers that make rail guns look like amateur hour. Now here's the problem. The gas molecules that we were looking at here, they're traveling at about the speed of sound. That's what room temperature is. However, if I take a droplet that's say, coming in from outer space at say cometary speed, some 30 kilometers per second, say I'm gonna have a smaller drop of liquid water and I've accelerated it up to 30 kilometers per second. And we're gonna collide it with a, another drop of water. Now remember what I said about water molecules basically never evaporate on these sorts of timescales. I mean, for reference, you're looking at about a trillionth of a second here and length scales of about a billionth of a meter. So this is effectively what would happen if you take something at cometary speed and collide it with the Earth. There isn't just plenty of energy to vaporize the incoming comet, but a decent chunk of Earth as well. Comets are essentially blocks of ice, but those molecules are traveling very quickly, which means their effective temperature when they stop here on Earth is about 100,000 degrees Celsius. <laughs> Don't believe me? We can do some very simple maths. I mean, let's just shoot a kilo of water at the Earth at 30 kilometers per second. Its energy is half mv squared, which is about 500 megajoules. It takes about 4,000 joules to heat one kilo up by one degree. So you're looking at about 100,000 degrees here. Surface of the sun for reference is about 6,000. Okay, so just smacking comets into Earth isn't a solution. But what if we were to just slow the comets down, park them in orbit, and then just deorbit them? Well, you remember we're going around the sun at some 30 kilometers per second. Well, low Earth orbit, it turns out, is still the best part of 10 kilometers per second. That's still 30 times the speed of sound. So ballpark figures, it won't just heat up to a mere 100,000 degrees, more like 10,000 degrees, which is what all that heat shield stuff's about. Now, let's take a look at that on the molecular dynamics simulation, shall we? So in one case, we're colliding at about cometary speed, and the other one, we're just coming in from low Earth orbit. And what you find is that uh, coming in from cometary speed, basically everything is vaporized. Meanwhile, the one that just comes in from orbit is mostly vaporized, but there are some little clumps that have survived a few picoseconds after the collision without being vaporized. Incidentally, if you color the water molecules by which group they're in, what you find is the incoming water molecules are always completely vaporized, whilst the static water in the case of the cometary impact is completely vaporized in the mere orbital velocity impact it's mostly vaporized. And I should stress, this is mostly vaporized on the time scale of uh, picoseconds. And if you want to know what it would look like if there was air present, well, <laughs> there was always air present. I just didn't show it. Because as you'll see, the air molecules on these sorts of time scales are not far off static. Uh, just to remind you, those air molecules on average are traveling about the speed of sound. Uh, bottom line is, Let's all hope the Earth never meets a wall, because if it does, we're made up mostly of water. And that water, just going around the sun, is traveling at some 30 kilometers per second. And at this point, I've just ignored gravity altogether. I've just dealt with the kinetic energy of these objects. 
But if we could just park it, not in orbit, and drop it from space, well, okay, it's one kilo is dropping about um, 100 kilometers, 100,000 meters. So the energy it's going to dissipate is um, 1 million joules for a kilo. It's still going to be about 250 degrees Celsius when it hits the ground. Now, Felix avoided a lot of this by, first of all, dissipating some of the heat through the spacesuit, and secondly, dissipating a lot of the energy by using a parachute. But all of that energy was fundamentally dumped into the atmosphere. Because Felix is an object with mass moving through the atmosphere. And if you want to know what that would look like, here is our cometary speed drop of water hurtling through air. And you see where it hits the air molecules and knocks them out of the way. That's what air resistance looks like. And this is what hitting the ground would look like. Incidentally, one of the creationist beliefs is there was a canopy of ice above the Earth, and that falling to Earth is what caused Noah's flood. In The Young Earth, this very fine scholar asked the question, how long is a day? In the last session, we talked about a firmamental canopy above the globe created on day number two. This is called the canopy theory, which says there was a layer of water or ice, probably ice, above the atmosphere. I happen to believe it's probably 10 or 20 inches of ice, super cold ice, suspended by the magnetic field. Yeah, regret to inform you that any object like that just falling to Earth would boil everything on Earth. And if it came in from uh, orbital velocity, you're looking at more like vaporizing everything liquid on the surface of the planet. Okay, fine. Let's do exactly like they did in Futurama and take a block of cometary ice and we're going to magically deorbit it somehow and bring it down with a spaceship, and then we're just going to drop it into the ocean. Well, this is where it gets depressing, because water is wonderfully simple to do calculations on in that a cubic centimetre or a milliliter of water is a gram a litre, as a smallish pop bottle is about a kilo, cubic metre is about a tonne, and a cubic kilometre is a gigaton, a billion tonnes. So merely to offset the ice that we're currently melting, it's give or take a trillion tons. That's 1,000 billion tons, 1,000 gigatons, which would be a block of ice roughly 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers, which is about the same dimensions as Halley's Comet. That was also about the size of the planet-killing comet in Don't Look Up. And if we can't all agree at the bare minimum that a giant Comet the size of Mount Everest! So even if you would say Halley's Comet is entirely ice, it's not, but that's a different story. But even if it was entirely ice, dropping something like that on Earth every year would merely offset the current rate that we're losing ice due to global warming. That's not to offset global warming, mind you. That's just to offset the ice that we're losing due to global warming. I mean, my God! I'd how do we even talk to each other? What have we, we, what have we done to ourselves? I think this would be a good time to establish that, that Isherwell and the president have oh, both said that there's both. benefits to... What? Well, we're boned.